Welcome to All Things Greater Burlington, where you will hear from the movers, shakers, and change makers that are moving Greater Burlington forward. Here is your host, Stephen Brody. Welcome to All Things Greater Burlington. We are really blessed here in the Greater Burlington area with so many activities and venues and historical locations. And what better place to start to get a feel for all things historical than the Des Moines County Historical Society. And we are pleased to have with us today um, Colton Neely, the Executive Director for the Des Moines County Historical Society, who I think has a pretty awesome job being involved with what he what he is doing. And so Colton, not to set you up too much, but uh, thank you so much for coming here today. Well, thank you. Thank you for having me. Why don't we start with um, talking about the Des Moines County Historical Society itself? You're the executive director of that. So what does that encompass and involve? So the Des Moines County Historical Society um, is an umbrella term for three sites. We run the Old Burlington Public Library, which is renamed as the Heritage Center. Um, We also have the Garrett Phelps House up the road from there. Um, And if you're not familiar with that, that's next to Snake Alley. And then we also have the Log Cabin, Hawkeye Cabin, or Crapo Park, whatever you want to call it, at at Crapo Park. Yeah. And we're actually opening up a new site inside of Hotel Burlington. You are. Okay. Is this uh, is this for public consumption? You can you can talk yep. about it now. It, for right now, yeah. Okay. <laughs> I know the. I think the site manager over there has been doing a lot of new stuff to the building to allow yeah. more commercial access, and she invited us to put in an exhibit. We've got a massive collection of Hotel Burlington stuff. Um, so we decided to pull that out. Hasn't seen the light of day in forever. So <laughs> we're like, it'd probably be better suited down in their lobby. Yeah. And we're looking forward to that. I must say, I've not had a chance to, to go to the log cabin or the Garrett Phelps house yet, but I did have the opportunity to visit with you recently over at the Heritage Museum. And I have to say, I was blown away. If anyone has not been there, My gosh, I need to encourage everyone to go and visit that place. I know you have ideas and plans of what to do there, but just for what's there currently is incredible. Is there any, I mean, tell us about, and I know you could probably talk about it forever, but (laughs) like in a snapshot, if people go to the Heritage Museum, what are they going to experience? So right away, the building itself is pretty, it's pretty wild. Um, once it used to be an old public library back in the, in the mid 1890s. And what makes that library much more unique is it's not a Carnegie library. Okay. Um, when Carnegie started giving money out to different communities to build their own library institutions, um, they had, they developed their own standard architectural design. I call it like a shoebox with shelves. Yeah. And our library was not that case. Ours was funded by a bunch of investors. Uh, Philip Crapo was one of them, uh, William Salter, and a bunch. I think the city in Burlington was involved with that too. And instead of just making a shoebox, they came up with a very well engineered building, has a skylight, um, a big grand gallery has old library stacks with glass floors. Um, all the woodwork is all original. Um, it is probably the most ornate building in probably this county. Yeah. And I will say I did walk on the glass floors and it's safe. It is it's safe. Okay. <laughs> it's tempered. <laughs> yeah, it's a it's a wild building. And Originally, our museum was out at Perkins Park at the Apple Trees building. And during the early 2000s, we moved into the old Burlington Library when they built the new library down the road. And I understand from just learning things recently that there that there's such a thing as free libraries. And there were non-free libraries, which is why if you travel around and you see on buildings... Every now and then, it'll say free library. Right. So back, you, if you brought went back a hundred years ago, um, the concept of a library was just—I mean, it was an old 
everybody knew what a library was, but it was a very select thing. You had to pay an admission or you had to, it's kind of like when you went to a movie store yeah. and you yeah. had to rent a movie, you had yeah. to pay for your book. Yeah. And that's when Carnegie was a big advocate of a free public library. Mm -hmm. So Burlington kind of stole that idea and they built their own without Carnegie's involvement. <laughs> and and it is on the, on the building, right? It does yep. say free library on there. Yep. It's a free uh, public library. And then there's, I can't quite remember what else. There's another phrase. I think it's like open to all or something yeah. on the other side of the building. Now you have, correct me if I'm wrong, three levels. <laughs> you would say. Or, or two. <laughs> What's open to the public? <laughs> so we have three levels that are open to the public. Okay. When you walk in through our main doors, um, that has a couple exhibits. We've got a grand gallery. We kind of have, it's kind of a hodgepodge of stuff right now. But we have uh, a crinoid exhibit. Um, we've got an exhibit on the actual library itself, which we're going to be developing pretty soon. Um. And then the crinoids you said was pretty extensive and unique yes. in that it's one of the larger collections yes. around, right? It's the largest uh, collection of crinoids with over 3,000 specimens that came from specifically Burlington limestone. Mm -hmm. um, there are other larger collections, but with just with this kind of rock, we are on the top three of the largest ones next to, I think it's the Smithsonian and Harvard or another Ivy league university. Right. Um, and what I do want to do in the next five years is we're going to be pulling out a lot of our older exhibits. I've been there for over a decade and we're going to make a much more immersive holocrinoids for not just adults, but kids can come and these, in. And, and these are all that are fossilized and embedded in, yes. in the rocks that have just been found over the, yeah. The decades, I guess. Yeah. Most people are familiar with them because if you go on a hike by a, a cliff edge, they look like little Cheerios. Uh -huh. And if you stack up those Cheerios and put a big frilly hat on it, that's what a crinoid <laughs> looks like. It's like a sea anemone on a stick. <laughs> is is crinoids, are they indigenous to this area? Do you know that's and why they're so, popular here? I want to say they've been here... Um, maybe if not before the Devonian era and they are, they were here when Iowa was underwater. Okay. We were an ocean at one point. Okay. Um, and then once the ocean receded, they kind of went with, cause you know, you have to breathe in water to survive. Yeah. Um, and over time it just sediment sat on top of the dead ones and that's where we got these fossils and yeah Iowa has got probably one of the larger deposits of crinoid fossils in probably any part of the world I will say when you took me around on the tour of of the museum I was fascinated by all the different collections that you have and that you shared with me how you get them I mean so much of it is donations so much of it is from estate sales yes now are those estate sales where the items didn't sell and they then were donated or were they purchased and given to you what both yeah there's a lot of reasons why we get stuff from estates we before i got here we kind of just waited until we got stuff and now i'm trying to change the focus and into finding things, being a little more aggressive with collecting and going outside of the building instead of sitting in our chairs and letting people give us stuff. Um, one, an example of this would be when the Murray Ironworks went under, there was an auction that went for sale, an original steam engine built from the 1920s from that factory. It was, if I remember, it was for sale in Sioux City, Iowa. Okay for about 900 bucks. That would be something if we had a trailer and somebody who could pick up, you know, a four ton steam engine <laughs> would be something that we would aggressively go find, yeah. hunt it and bring it back to our museum. Yeah. Instead of, we'll just wait for a wrench to come in and, oh, cause you found this in someone's estate sale. It's, 
Yeah. There's a lot that goes into collecting. And we, over the years, since the 70s, we've just acquired so much stuff and so much knowledge about this county. Yes. And, and stuff and accumulating the stuff is an accurate assessment, I believe. <laughs> you do. You have a lot. And it would seem a lot of hours have to be spent to catalog them. Yes. And to place them where they should be. I, I have to believe that you have volunteers <laughs> that help you with that. Volunteers and staff. <laughs> okay. They originally, most people probably remember the little index cards that you have to go, when you go to the library to look for a book. Yeah. And you pull out the drawer and you find yeah. out where geography is. Good old Dewey Decimal. <laughs> it's kind of like they ran that way uh -huh. until I got here. They oh, you changed it. They were still using a typewriter. Okay. And an old historical typewriter, maybe. <laughs> uh, just old enough that now I can't buy the ink ribbon to it. Gotcha. So that we ha I we don't even know how much w uh, of stuff that we really do have. Yeah. So what we're doing is we're actually putting it into a database system, kind of like Google. If we're looking for teapots, we could put in teapots and about every record that had the word teapot and it would pop up and that way it'll help us just keep inventory a lot better. Yeah. Um, and while we're doing this, we're just finding things that a lot of people forgot over the years since the seventies, we've had a, a wood collection that popped up where we had, they're about four by four inch by two inch slats of every tree specimen you could find there's probably about 2,000, 3,000 little boards of different trees. Okay. Um, we found a medical human skull. Uh, <laughs> you found like there at the, at the museum, just amongst the, all the stuff you have just in a little black box, but Oh, how fun was that? I'm sure to the person who opened <laughs> the box. <laughs> That caused me to hyperventilate. <laughs> oh, it was you that found it? Yeah. <laughs> oh, great. <laughs> but it, it was used for when we, and the, the funny part is, is like with these little cards, you could look at how we got this stuff. Yeah. And some, it was a doctor that donated it to us back in the 80s. Yeah. So it's fine to have because it was the donor of that skull wanted it for research. Yeah. So. A little startling, but <laughs> tell me about tell me again the story having to do with Aldo Leopold because Aldo Leopold has got history here in, oh, yeah. in, in Burlington, and you were sharing with me how you came across some old letters, yes, of his. Can you can you talk about that, please? So, oh, that's an interesting story. Um, a while ago, we started the project of cleaning the collection, and in our stacks room, um, we were turning a portion of it to just media, photographs, letters, newspapers, any kind of paper and ephemera. And my assistant director, Tim Blackwell, and I were walking around, and we were trying to, we were just trying to come up with ideas of how we can sort all this stuff. And there was about two, three boxes that said Leopold on the side of them. And uh, we thought it is, there was a Leopold cabinetry or there was, uh, it was a Leopold furniture store or something. Yeah. We thought it was probably advertisement for them. Okay. So we opened it up and it was, it, it had their logo on it, but they were all envelopes that were all handwritten, probably early 1890s, probably 1910. Yeah. It was hard to tell how old these really were. <clears throat> yeah. And the first one we pulled open and pulled the letter out was signed by Aldo Leopold when he was like 10 years old. Oh, wow. And it was, and it, I think it talked about, I think he was talking to his grandpa saying how much fun he had at a hunting trip. And I remember I looked at Tim and he looked at me and we're like, I think this is a big deal. 
<laughs> I mean, we've seen this guy's name before. Yeah. I'm not from Burlington, so it's like, yeah, I was like, I this name's pretty familiar. I think this is a pretty big deal. Yeah, and a lot of it was never even cataloged. They just put it in a box and they put it on a shelf and never really thought. So anything. once you find out, once you find out the historical significance of something like that, what do you do to preserve it to to maintain its integrity? Um. So when we originally found it, they were kind of put in an acid-free box, um, kind of crammed in there. What normally what we would do? They have. Um, I would call poly polyurethane plastic sleeves. They're kind of like magazine sleeve sure. covers. Yeah. But they're really hard plastic. And we'll unfurl all of those envelopes at some point and we're going to stick them in there so you could hold them and they could still they're they're pretty straight up. They won't break, they won't. It, it's really nice and they could slide into a file way easier in and out. Yeah. And not only do these things keep the letter nice and flat, but it takes away the folds and it makes it a little bit stronger. Because mm -hmm. when you fold something for so long, at some point, the little seams on every, on little bits, bits and pieces of paper start to split. So we got to try to stop that. Right, right. Other than that, I mean, there are techniques out there for like re restarching paper. So it's a little bit more durable just outside of any sort of protection but other than that the less time you touch it the better it'll it'll stay in the long run yeah you were talking also about um partnerships and relationships that you do as well with the preservation station yes downtown um and i forget exactly what what it was that you showed me but then it just sparked that conversation it's like well, wouldn't this be great giving it over to them? And then you said, well, we are talking to them and we are engaging in, in uh, sharing. Yeah. So uh, w what's that arrangement like between the two? So when we get in donations, a lot of our stuff is we received decades ago, 70s, 80s. And unfortunately, a lot of those people, especially with the state sales, aren't around anymore. Yeah. Normally when we get in a donation, we have to give it back out first to the donor. And if the donor can't take it back for any sort of reason, then we have to give it back out to an organization like preservation station for free. Okay. Came in free. It's got to leave out for free. Somehow I was just joking with the receptionist. Art museums seem to get away with that because they sell paintings all the time, but <laughs> most historical societies can't really do that. It's, it, it does, it's not very nice to do. Yeah. Um, so what we had was we were going through a bunch of stuff from the 70s and 80s, stuff that's never been on display. And if it was on display, no one probably ever noticed it. Um, stuff that didn't have a lot of information, kind of like, you know, you find a, a ratchet in a bucket and it says it was found in some guy's garage. It probably isn't that significant. Yeah. So we just kind of gave it to Preservation Station for free. And they, so far, they've given us stuff back. We got glass shelves, nice heavy-duty glass shelves that we're missing in some of our other cabinets. Yeah. Um, so we have this arrangement where we give them something. They kind of give us something that will help us out. And that's what we do. It. And it's it's been a process as we've been going through this collection. It's yeah. So when you have so much Colton that that you have there, and again, you've got a cadre of military uniforms. You have rifles. <laughs> you know, you've got you've got some weaponry. You've got old golf clubs. You've got so many fascinating things that that is just a, a walk through memory lane in terms of people's upbringings yeah you know, when it comes to household items a lot of it is not on display yeah so what's the plan for it what you know what do you do is it you're just hanging on to it uh do you hope to think of a a way that you can get it out and show people because there's so much there. It's a good question. Uh, before me, I don't think they've really thought about that kind of a, a question. 
Um, there's a lot of things you can do with a lot of stuff. There's, you can have um, media collection. So, or I would say researchable stuff like the Aldo Leopold letters there. You can have them on display, but when a kid walks by, they're probably gonna be like, oh, that's an old piece of paper with cursive on it. Not much real entertaining to look at. Yeah. Um, or not much entertainment value. But that's stuff that we would probably keep in the back. And if someone came in that was looking for material for their thesis or something, then we could pull that stuff out and they can research it. Um, we also have educational collections, which we're trying to sort through right now. This would be stuff that if it broke, it wouldn't matter. This is stuff that we could use for demonstrations. Um, up at our Garrett Phelps mansion, we have a farm machinery collection up there that we're going through. And we have a bunch of those old sickles and scythes for grass cutting. Yeah. And we pulled, I think we have about six or seven of them just sitting in a corner. And we're going to sharpen them up. And maybe I'm going to try and talk to some guys from old threshers to come out and do a demonstration with them. And we'll let our grass nice. grow a little bit longer. Uh huh. And then maybe if it, depending on how safe it is, maybe we could have some adults try it out. Yeah. Something that you don't normally do nowadays, but it could teach somebody yeah. about how the past or what the, what the past was really like. Yeah. Um, another thing is uh, you could have it in like a vivarium display, uh, stuff that you could put in a display case just for entertainment. Uh, one of the things we found was um, we have two slices of wedding cake from 1908. The cake still exists? The cake still exists in a little box. Uh, okay. <laughs> it looks like, uh, you ever seen sponge candy? Uh-huh. It looks like that, but chocolate. And smells like a mothball. <laughs> oh my gosh. Uh, that would be something that would entertain you. So if you had that like in a little display case with a little story about how we got that, that'd be kind of like a Vivarian display. I can't believe that that has sustained a hundred <laughs> years. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, we've heard like that with Twinkies, but my goodness, like a couple pieces of, what is it hermetically sealed? Right? It, it's like in a little, like a little, uh, shoe box with a bow on it. It's yeah. nothing special. It's unbelievable. It's not deteriorated. I, d I don't quite understand how that happens, but that's something I wouldn't mind down the road looking into how, how that survived over the years with no preservation. Yeah. Um, another thing that we, we would use our collections for is like, uh, background display pieces. Um, an example of this would be, in the future, when we start doing our holocrinoids, I wouldn't mind um, taking our crinoid rocks and embedding them into a wall that looks like a, a limestone cliff. Nice. That's a great idea. Or we also have a, it's like a one of those old pump wells that you'd have out in your yard back in the day. Yeah. We've got that, but we also have like a 15, 20 foot long wooden pipe that would have been drilled into the ground on top of the pump. So that would be something that we would display saying that these rocks went all the way down in the ground and we could stack or stand that whole pipe up with the thing up there just to see how far underground this thing would have really been. Yeah. Um, stuff like that on display. Uh, but they, but before me, they never really sorted their collection like that. Yeah. So. So, and, and that's a, that's a good segue, Colton. What is it that you bring to the Heritage Museum? Because obviously you have a passion for this. <laughs> so where, where did this come from? Where oh. at some point it was, hey, I'd really love to see if I could do this for a living. I want to say I started getting involved um, with museums well before high school. I've been dealing with museums for about eight years. And... Even before then, as a kid, my parents would bring me all over looking at different museums across the Midwest. Yeah, sure. Um, and it it's just interesting because there's a lot of fun stuff out there and a lot of hole-in-the-wall museums that really you you learn a lot. And I felt like over the time, 
I would be doing this with my parents. I just wanted to get more and more involved with starting my own museum. It's kind of hard to start your own museum. So <laughs> when I graduated high school, uh, I went to University of Iowa and I got my degree in museum studies and history. And from there, I started working in a lot of different museums and got really immersed with it. One of my favorite museums I worked at was Living History Farms in Urbandale, Iowa. Um, and what that that's a whole different experience because that museum is meant to look like the year it's trying to represent. Okay. So there's a whole town that's supposed to be 1875. And everybody, the staff and volunteers dress up like they're from 1875 and they do things like they did in 1875. Got it. Um, you're not acting like you're from 1875. So if someone whips out a camera, you're not like scared <laughs> half to death. But yeah. just it's it's a way to explain what people did back in the day. And I got really involved doing that. It I worked in a print shop there and I ran a uh, a letter press. You ever seen one of those big old machine that clamps shut mm -hmm. and you have to like, when you print stuff, you have to put a card in there and whip back out after it got prints yeah. or printed. Um, I was a butler at the mansion up the road and they have a, another little site called the 1900 farm. And I was a, a farm hand and it was just really fun. Um, and then after that, I ended up working at University of Iowa's Museum of Natural History. And they have a, I did a couple different things. They had an egg collection or ogology collection, over 10,000 bird eggs. And I spent an, a couple years cataloging all of that. Oh, man. And everything down to a hummingbird egg, which is no bigger than a Tic Tac. <laughs> to ostrich eggs that were the size of basketballs. And then after I got that done, I started working in the wet specimen collection, which was all these fish that the DNR caught. Yeah. And they put them in jars of alcohol. And I was swapping jars of alcohol with other jars of alcohol because when a fish sits in one too long, it gets kind of stinky looking. <laughs> and you got to put in different alcohol. <laughs> and you then, have done a lot. Oh, and that's, not a, that's just the tip of the iceberg. Oh, man. Okay. We I ran Old Capitol in Iowa City. Um, I was a tour guide for there and uh, a docent manager. And yeah, it's you could say I've seen it all. It's and probably there's more you haven't seen. I, I could say that I I know what these people went through a hundred years ago. Living History Farms was a major part of my life. It if you you can talk about history, but there is. Most people don't understand what it was like living through that kind of time. Yeah. It's, it's a different experience. Yeah. Well, and, and, and you bring a unique perspective because now that you have that experience, then you can, you can bring that here and you can kind of bring, yeah. bring that to life. And that's what we're going to try to do to Garrett Phelps. We're going to try and make that into a full-time museum. And I wouldn't mind trying to get it to be like the Flynn mansion where people are kind of dressed up for the time and yeah and kind of serving people coming in and acting like the family's away on a picnic while the maids and the butlers are taking care of the house. Nice. So nice. Yeah. I can't believe we're almost out of time. Is there, um, is there something that you can share in our remaining moments of, um, what you're dreaming up there, uh, at, at the museum is uh, something that you you're hoping to accomplish maybe in, in the near future. Yes. Um, a lot <laughs> <laughs> there, Garrett Phelps, the mansion has been kind of underrun and within probably the next two year, two, three years, I wouldn't mind turning that in again to a full-time running museum. Mm -hmm. And then on top of that, I want to try to install that hall of crinoids. Yeah. That's a big, big exhibit that can go in, but that's going to take a lot of a lot of money and a lot yeah. of manpower to do. Yeah. Um, and on that other side of the Heritage Center, we want to try to revitalize what the library looked like 100 years ago. Sure. So we're going to try to open up the stacks again to general public, 
we're going to try to clear out the grand gallery so you can rent that out as a wedding or a business space or so. Yeah. Very good. What are your, what are your current hours? Um, we are open Monday to Friday, um, 10 to four and then Saturday, 10 to three. Okay. Um, hopefully we'll be expanding that pretty soon, but yeah, but right now that's what our hours are. And people, people can donate and yes. they can contribute. Yes. Is there a particular website or do they come and visit with you in order to dis- have that discussion? They, they can do both. They can come in and donate. Um, we take all forms of payment. Um, and you can also donate on Facebook and you can donate on our website. There's just a donate link immediately when you open up the website. So. And I would imagine there's got to be grant opportunities out there as well that you can seek out yeah. for, for what you're wanting to accomplish. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, very good. I, like I said, I, we could go another half hour. I mean, this is incredible, all, all the stuff that we <laughs> shared. And so, Colton, thank you very much. I mean, I just wish you continued success in what you're doing. It's fascinating there. It's it's history. It's living history. If anybody wants to know the history of this area, they want to know. They just want to go there and, and say, wow. Yeah. If they didn't know what was happening here. All they have to do is walk in there and it just opens their eyes up to everything that occurred in this area. Yeah. And the historical significance yeah. of this area. Yeah, it'll be interesting trying to revitalize both both of the, the, those sites. Well, wonderful. Well, thank you again for being with us today. It's been a pleasure. Well, thank you for having me. And I would encourage anyone who has not been to either of the locations that Colton oversees to please go ahead and, and check it out. You will you will be fascinated and you will enjoy it, especially if you are a history buff. Thank you so much for listening today. We encourage you to like and subscribe, all things Greater Burlington. If you have an idea or thought about a potential um, guest to have on, let us know. Contact us at the Greater Burlington Partnership, and we will uh, – We will look forward to that. Until then, take care. We'll see you next time on All Things Greater Burlington. You have been listening to All Things Greater Burlington with Stephen Brody. Be sure to hit the subscribe button to catch all new episodes. To learn more about All Things Greater Burlington, visit greaterburlington.com slash ATGB.